Today we're going to take a look at the 8-bit shift register. I'll be using these chips as part of my Nixie 2 project, so I'll talk about what they are, how they work, and how we can interface to them using a microcontroller like the STM32. The shift register I've chosen is the TPIC 6B595. These chips come in two different packages. We have the dual inline package, which is what you'd use for something like a breadboard or a through-hole PCB. And then obviously we have the surface mount variant, which is much smaller and can be used on surface mount PCBs. These shift registers are quite unique because they're high voltage, making them an excellent one chip solution for driving Nixie tubes. The reason they're an excellent choice is because they have 50 volt clamping voltage on the output, which means that when we're not using certain pins on the Nixie tube, they won't light up due to current leaks. So what is a shift register? In the simplest terms possible, a shift register is a way of temporarily transferring or storing binary data. This particular shift register is of the type serial in parallel out. Let's take a closer look at what that means. I've created this simple block diagram that shows a microcontroller sending 8 bits of data into a shift register. The data has been sent in a serial format, meaning we have a single packet of 8 bits, also known as 1 byte. Assuming we send the least significant bit first, you can see how each of those 8 bits gets transformed into a parallel output. All of this is achieved using bit shifting, hence the name of the device. Each time the clock is pulsed, a bit gets shifted until all the data has been transferred. You can now see that using just one serial data output pin, we can have 8 different outputs using a single chip. The total number of outputs can also be increased significantly just by cascading two or more of these chips together and I'll show you that a little later in the video. So let's grab the data sheet and look at our pinouts. Here's our chip and our pin configurations. Now a lot of these are gonna be obvious, like these top ones are no connection, so they're not connected to anything. We've got standard ground connections, and then we've got the ones we've already kind of seen, our drain outputs, so we've got zero to three and four to seven, so we don't have to worry about those. But there are of course a few others here that we need to try and understand. So we've got serial in, which again we kind of saw earlier on. That's going to be our serial in data from the microcontroller. We've then got serial out here, which can be used to cascade two shift registers together. So we can connect the serial out of one shift register to the serial in of another shift register. We've then got our register clear pin here. We've also got our output enable pin. We've got our serial clock. And then here we have a register clock. So now that we know what pins we're concerned with, let's go and find out what each of these does and how we can use it. As you can see here on page nine, there's an operational diagram in the top right that tells us everything we need to know in order to communicate with this device. As I mentioned earlier in the video, these chips can be cascaded by connecting the serial output of the first chip to the serial input of the second chip. These chips can be cascaded as many times as you want. So you can have hundreds of outputs if you need them. Using this approach, I've cascaded two of these shift registers together on a breadboard. The second chip essentially just daisy chains with all the inputs from the first chip, as shown on the schematic. Each of the drain outputs is then connected to the cathode of an LED. Doing this upgrades our 8-bit output to a 16-bit output. Now you can really see the potential here. These chips are commonly used to drive LED matrices and generally any projects that require a high number of outputs. As I've talked about in the past, SPI is a communication protocol. It stands for Serial Peripheral Interface, and this is what we'll be using to send data to our shift registers using the STM32. Remember I said that our shift registers take serial data in and then output that data in a parallel format. In this particular example, SPI lets me send two bytes of data or 16 bits to 16 different outputs using a single data pin. Let's also jump into STM32 CubeMX and I'll show you how I've set up the SPI. All right, so we're back in CubeMX here and this is a base project which I showed you how to create in a previous video. If you haven't seen that yet, I highly recommend checking it out. I'll leave a card up above. For this video, we're gonna focus on SPI as I mentioned. So over on the left here, you'll see a little tab called SPI1. You'll wanna click on that and then we're gonna to go to mode, select transmit only master. The reason we're selecting this one is because we're not expecting to receive any data back from the shift registers. We're just pushing data out to it and it kind of takes care of itself from there. We're gonna disable hardware signal and then down here in the parameter settings, make sure your data size is eight bits 
I'm going to be sending the least significant bit first. I set my prescaler to 16 and that's basically it in terms of the setup. So what we need to focus on now is which pins that's created down here on the bottom of the chip because we need to correlate between those and what we saw in our operational diagram. So this top line here we've got serial clock that's going to be our PA5 here and then underneath that we've got this output enable. Now I had to create this using a GPIO and I've done that on PC4. The next one we've got serial in and that's going to be PA7 which is SPI1 master out serial in. We've then got our register clock which I also created a GPIO for which is going to be PC5 and finally we have our shift register clear which I created another GPIO for which is going to be PA4 and that's basically it. That's all the pins we're going to need in order to communicate with the shift register. So let's jump through this step by step and write code to match it. So now I'm in Visual Studio using Visual GDB and you can see here I've created a function called send SPI data and in here I'm basically going through all the steps that this diagram takes us through. So if we think of this diagram from left to right we're going in time series so we're going to look at what's happening as we travel across the diagram. Through my own experimentation I found it useful to always clear the buffer first before you try and send anything else and then what we need to do is follow this diagram. You can see the first thing that happens here is we disable the outputs. Now this is our output enable but it's actually not enable right so we're pulling not enable high which disables the outputs. So you can see that's what I did here in the next step, I disabled the outputs. We're also not clearing the shift register, right? So we're opening the buffer there. So you can see the next thing I did is open the buffer for transmission, which is the same pin that we used to clear the buffer, except this time we're setting it high. Then on the diagram, the next thing that happens is the clock is pulsing, and that's already gonna be happening because we're gonna try and transmit the data and that does it automatically. The next thing that occurs after that is the serial input data is being sent. And you can see I've done that here on the next line. So we just call HAL SPI transmit. And what I'm doing here is passing in an array with the data that I want to send. And then after that, you have to specify the byte size. So my byte size here is gonna be two which is 16 bits. And then finally, that's just a timeout value, which you can just leave as 10 by default. After the serial input data has been sent, the next thing to occur here is the registers are clocked, right? Remember we created a GPIO for this. So all we need to do is write to that pin, pull it high and then pull it low immediately after. You can include a little delay in here to try and kind of make sure it captures it. And then finally what happens after clock in the registers is we pull not enabled low, which enables the outputs and allows us to see our data displayed on the LEDs. The first example I'll show you is how we can display hexadecimal numbers. If you're unfamiliar with hex, it's basically a 16-based system that simplifies how binary is presented. Here's a table that shows what each hex value represents in binary. All right, so to give some examples here of how we can display binary outputs on the LEDs, I'm gonna go ahead and change this data here to FFFF. And that represents ones in binary, as we saw on the truth table I showed you earlier on. So now if I flash my code to the board, we should see that all 16 LEDs should light up. And there you go. So you can see that in my SPI data array, which is a uint 16, which I'm just declaring at the top, and then setting that data to be four Fs here in hex, which is 16 ones in binary. And let's go ahead and try something else. So let's try and turn half of them off, right? So if I go and do FF00, which now represents this in binary, if I reflash the code, we should see now that the last eight LEDs turn off. And there we go. We can see that's working as well. And you can do this for any numbers, you know, like if we just wanted to display one. So if we wanted to do this, if we wanted to turn a single LED on, this value in hex represents this value in binary. So let's go and flash the code. And we should see that the LED, the least significant bit should be lit up which is the one on the far right, and there you go. Just from this simple example, we can see that it's very easy to transmit 16 bits of data using a single data pin on the STM32. This process is exactly the same whether you're sending 8 bits, 32 bits, or 16 bits. 
you just have to adjust your byte size in the SPI protocol. Now let's try to make our LED do something cool. I like to call this the walking ones because we have a single bit that's moving back and forth between all 16 LEDs. I think this is really cool because the LEDs are quite literally demonstrating bit shifting in real time. Okay, so now we're gonna try something a little more ambitious. So what I'm doing here, the value we've got stored in SPI data is hex 0001. Now in binary, that represents this. So all we're doing in this line of code is we're saying whatever data is in SPI data, which is this value, we're gonna shift a bit over based on which LED we're on. So for LED one, we would shift this data over by one. So what happens is the LED that turns on goes from this one to this one, right? And as we go through the for loop and get to LED two, we then shift the bit over two places. So what we end up with is this. And what happens is we keep shifting all the way over until eventually the bits shift all the way to the end which is where we hit this line of code. So we're saying if we hit LED number 15, we just reverse the process, right? So when we hit LED 15, we'll be over here and it'll look like this. So when we hit that LED 15, what we then do is start going back the other way. And we do that the same way. We're just shifting the bit backwards and we are decrementing the LED number now instead of incrementing it. So what we do is go from this to this and then from this to this. And we just keep going back and forth. And that's basically what I like to call the walking ones. It's pretty fun. It's a fun exercise to do with code. And you can see you could do it relatively easily using two for loops. And remember as well, we can also adjust the delay here. So I'm gonna leave this at 100 milliseconds. So I'm gonna run the code and we should see the LEDs kind of pinging back and forth. So let's have a look. And there we go. You can see exactly what I described there. So we start off with that 0001 and each LED we iterate through, we shift that bit over by the correct amount. And you just get this cool kind of effect where the LED is jumping back and forth. So let's slow it down a bit. Let's go for something like uh, 500 milliseconds, just so we can kind of see it a little better. So let's try that. So you can see there we've slowed that down and it's a bit easier to watch. So you can see exactly what's happening. And you can make this as slow or as fast as you want. If we try and make it crazy fast, let's go for say a 50 millisecond delay and see if the camera can keep up with it. So that's going really fast and the camera shutter speed can't really keep up with it. In real life it's quite smooth, but through the camera it's not gonna be as smooth. You get the idea and it's just cool. It's a good way of demonstrating bit shifting in real time. And it just goes to show how easy it is to control a whole bunch of outputs using just a simple data pin from the STM32. As I mentioned earlier, the objective for me with the shift registers is to display all the different digits on a Nixie tube. Using the Nixie power supply I built in the previous video, all I have to do is connect the anode to the 200 volt rail and then I have to connect each of the ground pins to whichever drain outputs I want on the shift register. Remember, I only have 10 outputs on my Nixie tube, so I'll only be making use of 10 bits here. And I've modified the previous example a little bit just to count up to nine instead of 16. So what we do now is we go from naught to nine and then back down from nine to zero. And basically I've tied each of the ground pins on the Nixie tubes to the correct uh, drain outputs. So we've got drain output 0 to 9 is Nixie to pin 0 to 9. And as we do this in the code, we should be counting up every second through 0 to 9 and 9 to 0. So let's try it out. Let's run the code. And there you go, you can see the Nixie tube is counting from north to nine and back down from nine to zero. And you can even still see the LEDs in the background because all I'm doing is just piggybacking off of those LED pins in order to display the numbers on the Nixie tube. Pretty cool. Hopefully you found that one quite useful and interesting. If you'd like to support the channel and see more videos like this in the future, 
please consider becoming a website member. It really helps the channel out and it helps fund projects like this. I'll leave a link in the description down below. As always, thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.